Well, I, my, my first thanks must go to the Society for inviting me to speak on this uh, notable occasion. I'm uh, very grateful and honoured to be, to be so asked. I must also thank the various individuals and organisations who provided many of the images that you will see um, uh, as I go through my talk this afternoon. Uh, it, uh, organisations ranging from the National Library and the National Museum of Scotland through other organisations like Adam and Archaeology and even the John Gray Centre here in Haddington. Um, I'm talking uh, in broad terms about the North Sea world, as you can see from my title. And um, uh, I thought it appropriate that the very first map I show you of East Lothian was actually drawn by a French cartographer, um, Gilles Robert de Bourgondi. In, seven, in 1759. The North Sea world, um, as I tend to define it, consists of not only the North Sea, but also the area of the Baltic. Effectively, um, it is um, that area from Essex in the south to Shetland and Iceland in the, in the north. And um, from here on the east coast of Scotland, uh, right across to Tallinn in uh, Estonia on, on the Baltic. Those of you who are privileged enough to live in, to be in the first four rows will be able to see on this map that there is a gap um, between uh, Berwick-on-Tweed and, and Aberdeen um, and uh, East Lothian is solidly within that gap. I'm hoping to um, fill that in uh, slightly now this afternoon. One place I will not be talking about this afternoon, and it would have made my talk much easier if I had been able so to do, is the city of Perth. Because if one wishes to look at the material cultural links between Scotland and the continent, Perth is the one place to look. But this is the first and only mention of Perth as is only appropriate with it within this sort of context. I should point out, of course, I'm talking about an historic period, and therefore there is a, a great deal of historical information that is um, available. Some of it quite recently published, a very interesting book on Scotland and the Flemish people, which some of you may well be aware of, came out two, uh, what, well, five years ago now, but um, uh, re relatively recent. And of course, there are a range of documents both here in Scotland and across the North Sea, which relate to the relationship between this country and the continent. And here you can see a manuscript currently in Leuven or Louvain in, um, in Belgium, which um, was, was written by Magnus McCulloch, clerk to William Sheaves of St. Of, um, uh, Archbishop of St. Andrews, um, uh, but is currently and uh, wrote it in 1477 when he was based in Flanders, in Brabant in this instance. Um, but I'm going to be looking at the various archaeological approaches. And again, I've just checked by standing at the back and I realise you cannot see this slide, so I apologise. But I'm just trying to show you a range of um, uh, the types of evidence that we can look at. So. Things like place names, we had a, a most interesting talk already this morning on, on place names this morning. Here we've got one which is Alta Schotland, Old Scotland. And it's actually, uh, it's the map at this the top image, um, it, it's actually a suburb of Gdansk or Danzig in Poland. And it's where a whole range of Scottish merchants uh, settled immediately outside the walls of Danzig because that meant that they were not... Um, uh, subservient to the laws of the city of Danzig, they were on the lands of the uh, of the bishop, and the bishop protected them. And so they set up an area which is still known as Old Scotland. I can pronounce it in German. I don't know how to pronounce it in Polish. Um, excavations, obviously, the excavation I'm showing you here is at Strausund in what was the former uh, East Germany. Um, the building you can see is from a city I've lived in for 40 years, although I, I'm now based in Edinburgh, um, uh, which, is, which is the city of Norwich. The coin comes from Aberdeen and is a jeton. It's a Nuremberg jeton, which is a trading token. 
um, and they were fairly ubiquitous around the North Sea region to facilitate commerce in the Middle Ages. And on the right hand side, and nobody will be able to see this, is a rather fun brick from Denmark with um, a graffito upon it. But it's also worth pointing out that we can get a relationship between that documentary record and the um, uh, uh, material culture, the archaeological record. So here we have an extract from Johann the Count book, roughly in the late 1390s, um, who was a merchant um, in northern Germany. And underneath, a barrel which was recovered from a remarkable wreck in the Gulf of Gdynia, which is north of Gdansk, um, on which, um, uh, and we know that Pilger was a, um, a, 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 a trader uh, engaged in, in the buying and selling of copper. It's called the Copper Wreck because there were so many copper ingots on it and also well-preserved barrels, one of which you can see has got his uh, merchant's mark carved into the top of the barrel. And again, those of you in the front four rows, if you look at the very top left of the document, you can see his merchants, the identical merchant's mark on that document. So we have a relationship between, um, uh, between the two uh, uh, objects. More directly, with a Scottish interest, um, there's a potential relationship um, in Sweden. The battle of uh, the, the Good Friday battle of 1520 was between the Danes and the Swedes. The Swedes were walloped by the Danes, or rather the Swedes were walloped by the Scots, because most of the, um, uh, most of the Danish army in this, uh, in this dreadful battle was made up of Scots, mercenary Scots. And although no um, uh, uh, isotopic examination has been made of these skeletons yet, it's highly likely that at least some of them will have, been, will have origins here in Scotland. But I'm going to start my lecture and let's see a fuzz. Is this, is this my... It's not me, I'm not talking. We, we try switching it off and on. Try switching it off and on. That's a, that's a very sophisticated way of approaching things. Um, it's worked though, thank you very much. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm starting here in Haddington because we are, we are standing in Haddington as a, uh, a picture of David I, who, is, who created the Borough Charter here around about 1147 or, or, or thereabouts. And the reason um, I'm starting with Haddington is because of the, the late Richard Fawcett died only very recently, a great loss to, to Scotland, frankly. Um, uh, Richard Fawcett pointed out uh, in several of his publications, that the west portal immediately behind you of this church, um, which could be dated into the 15th century, uh, almost certainly had its antecedents in Netherlandish architecture. It is not a Scottish form of architecture at the west end of this church. It is something which is coming from the Low Countries. And the place that he cited um, as origins of, of that uh, facade um, uh, on, on the uh, west side of this church was the Dominican friar in Brooklyn. Now, this is a picture by a man called Johannes Baerbock. It dates to about 1796, and it's a drawing of that complex in Bruges um, immediately prior to its destruction. It was pulled down at about 1801 during the Napoleonic French occupation of Flanders. However, my colleague Hubert de Witte, who um, was the city archaeologist at Bruges until he retired a couple of years ago, uh, excavated in the mid-1990s and uncovered the remains of that portal, um, which you can see in the left-hand photograph, uh, together with a plan. And that has now been incorporated into a new apartment block which is what you can see on the left hand side. But again, I hope that you'll be able to make out, even if you're fairly close to the back of the nave, you'll be able to make out that the um, uh, recovered area, the excavated area of that west portal of the Dominican church in Bruges in the left hand photograph um, has remarkable similarities to the doorway uh, just behind you. So quite clearly we have 
um, connections in the 14th and 15th centuries um, uh, visible within material culture between um, uh, this country and the near part of the continent. But there are other areas, again within this church, where that is possible to see as well. So for instance, the roof timbers have recently been examined by Coralie Mills, and it was published oh, very, very recently in the latest uh, um, Discovery and Excavations in Scotland volume, um, examining the nave timbers of the roof above the nave here, which was reconstructed after the destruction of this church during the rough wooing in the 1540s. Um, and what she seems to have established is that the timbers there were reused probably from the choir um, and put up into the nave. But so uh, as you can see, most of the timbers date from about 1400 and they come from Pomerania Danzig area. What is now Poland was East Prussia um, prior to the Se Second World War. And that area, the area coming out through Danzig and also through Riga in Latvia, were um, huge export areas for timber which were going right across Western Europe and solidly into the British Isles as well. So increasingly dendro provenancing that um, aspect of dendrochronology which seeks to find where timbers were coming from um, is able to establish um, that uh, this sort of material is happening. Within um, uh, East Lothian we can see that um, again in relatively recent work at Fenton Tower here before it was um, reconstructed. This is near, near North Berwick. And um, again, here we've got 16th century timbers probably coming from southern Sweden. And you can see on the map, looking at the uh, Scottish chronology of oak timbers, which have now been recovered from a, a range of buildings um, uh, in Scotland, that the major concentration of um, sources for, for those timbers is um, coming from the uh, southern Scandinavian area. Uh, so, in fact, the stuff coming out of uh, Danzig is, in, in a Scottish instance, is, is, is relatively limited compared to southern Sweden, nor northern Denmark. We can get other ideas of um, uh, the way in which commerce was developing between uh, East Lothian in particular, Scotland in general, and, and the continent um, from other sources. A remarkable one is Andrew Halliburton's um, uh, ledger. Now Halliburton was the conservator of the Scottish staple. That meant that he was the official based in Flanders who was responsible for ensuring that Scottish wool exports uh, to, to the continent were all being administered and taxed appropriately. Um, between Scotland and, and the county of Flanders. Uh, he was based in um, Middleburg and Veer, um, although his predecessors had been based in Bruges. The staple was originally there until in the 15th century, Bruges River started to silt up and the staple moved. Um, and Halliburton, who is at the end of the 16th century, um, as you can see, died in 1507, um, uh, moved, moved with it. Now, this is a very rare survival in, in a British national context, not just a Scottish context. Um, uh, and what is uh, interesting is that you, one can see a whole range of goods that uh, Halliburton was acquiring on behalf of clients back here in Scotland. And if you look at the range of things, sugar, dried fruit, nuts, drugs and spices, wine, bells, hats, furs, woolen textiles, fine silks, metal whales, they're essentially luxury goods. This is a man um, who is purchasing, uh, and he comes from East Lothian, by the way, which is why he's especially pertinent. Um, he, he is purchasing um, this, the, these materials on behalf of relatively wealthy clients here here in Scotland. Um, and we can see examples surviving in, in the archaeological record of the types of uh, things that could be coming in. Now these are both um, museum exhibits in um, uh, Melrose Abbey, but on the left hand side you've got some Spanish pottery 
um, which, which has been imported. And on the right hand side, um, a, slight, a slightly different thing, but it's a piece of sculpture, almost certainly executed by a man called Don Murrow, who was a, um, uh, a French um, Thank you. Um, who, who was a French sculptor um, based um, uh, here in Scotland, probably trained at Saumur in central France on the Loire, but we know he worked at St Andrews, Glasgow Cathedral, Melrose, as you can see, Paisley and, and other locations. The other interesting luxury item that is coming into Scotland um, are exa or fragments which have been recovered from archaeology of stove tiles. Now, stove tiles were used on stoves, unsurprisingly. You can see surviving examples uh, in many North European countries. They may well have originated in Switzerland, but they're heavily adopted within the Germanic lands to the, to the north of that. Um, they're often highly decorated. Uh, certainly by the 16th century, they're, they're frequently carrying either dynastic or um, uh, religious iconography upon them, um, but they're very rarely found in Britain. And uh, uh, there are a number of them coming in, in, into Scotland. Uh, several examples have turned up in Edinburgh. Some have been found in, um, uh, in Perth. I wasn't going to mention Perth uh, and, and in St Andrews. The, um, the probable reason that we're not getting them very much in Scotland, and the same goes for England. There's one fragment from Norwich. I think there are one or two fragments from London. Very, very few indeed. So they're quite clearly um, uh, not, com not uh, coming, coming into this country, despite the fact that a stove is so much more efficient than a dirty great log fire, is because of controls. Customs controls, probably, in, or insular market controls with, with it within both England and Scotland, which prohibit German craftsmen from coming here. Stove tiles are very fragile. Uh, when they extend to Scandinavia, it's quite clear that German craftsmen are going into Scandinavia and setting up kilns and making them in Scandinavia because they don't travel very easily. That was not permitted in England. It almost certainly was not permitted in Scotland either. So we, we, we have a sort of Brexit-like thing here where we've got controls on things coming from the continent um, which we can't actually um, bring, bring into this country and therefore we don't adopt a technology um, which we would have adopted otherwise. So these are imports. What about exports? Well, the exports that are going out um, and again, we know much of this from documentation. They tend to be bulk goods, and they tend to be things which I think we categorize as necessities rather than luxuries. So wool is clearly one of the big, big exports from this part of the world to, to the continent in the 14th and 15th and the early 16th centuries. Hides are going out. Cloth, coarse cloth is going out not fine cloth. If, if there's fine cloth, it's coming in from the continent. And fish. Um, uh, these are the sorts of, of, of goods which, which are, are leaving the country and, go, and going to the continent. Um, much of the wool being produced by the great monastic institutions which occupy southeastern Scotland. And Melrose, again, is a good example. Those um, uh, institutions had a range of granges where the sheep which produced the wool were farmed. Some of those granges um, we know from documentation, some we know still exist. One of such is here, Penshield Grange um, in East Lothian. It's not been excavated. We know it was there um, round about 1200, so right at the beginning of the 13th century. There is a surviving ruin, which probably dates to about the 15th century. There was a Royal Commission survey of it, but to my knowledge, nobody has ever uh, done any more intensive work there at all. It's fairly near the White Adder Reservoir, if you want to walk in, in, in that direction. They do have potential, archaeologically, for increasing our understanding of how management of this resource took place. And we can see an example of that if we look at a German site near Wilhelmshaven in northwestern Germany at a place called Wirt Essens. Uh, 
This is a 13th century um, uh, uh, sheep grange where the organic material survived particularly well. It was, it, was, it was very wet. And what you can see in the range of timbers here are a series of plank walls in parallel lines for controlling the sheep, a great well and a large tank for water. Essentially, it's sheep washing or sheep dipping type of facility, um, which was um, uh, being established at, at this location. There's no reason to doubt that there must have been um, uh, similar facilities here in, south, in southeastern Scotland. And we, if we could find um, a Grange site with, the, with similar organic survival, no doubt we, we would be able to locate similar structures. Moving the wool probably meant taking it to ports. Now, prior to the loss of Berwick, no doubt much of the um, uh, monastic uh, wool fr from Melrose and other abbeys would have gone to Berwick, but you could have taken it northwards um, along the Malcolm's Road, Melrose to Lauder, and thence from the Herring Road from, from Lauder to Dunbar, for instance. And we're, one can obviously trace these routes still with, within the landscape, a form of um, landscape archaeology. But they're bulk goods, and bulk goods therefore need a bulk carrier. And the bulk carrier of the later Middle Ages, of the 14th and 15th centuries, was the cog, a deep water vessel, which tended to have to berth in standing water rather than to draw up onto a beach like earlier craft, Viking Age craft, if you like, could have done so. This is the Bremen cog, dates from about uh, 1384, something like that. It was. Um, discovered in the River Weser in Bremen in 1963. It had broken loose from its moorings, presumably in Bremen itself, floated downstream and come to rest on its side. Um, uh, was never salvaged and because it got buried in the mud, it was uh, particularly well preserved. It survived pretty well up to gunnel height um, at, the top, at the top of the boat. And it's now in the Deutsche Schifffahrtsmuseum in Bremerhaven. Um, it's the most famous of the cogs, although others are now known. Three recently have come up in Tallinn. If you watched Bethany Hughes' Treasures of Estonia two or three weeks ago, you would have seen one of them on there. Two others came up at Dole to an extension of a harbour in Antwerp. There's one known from Riga, for instance. There's one, I think, from uh, Western Denmark as well. Um, we know of these workhorses of the North Sea at this period, but deep, deep bulk carriers like cogs need deep water. And the obvious deep water ports near here are um, probably North Berwick, certainly Leith, and um, possibly Dunbar at Belhaven Bay, which of course was lost in the in the 19th century. But what about a port for Haddington? How are people getting to the continent in order to look at churches and then come back here to uh, build something similar? Well, there's long been a suggestion that Haddington's port was at Abilady. And um, this is Johann Blau's map of 1654. Um, and again, the privileged few at the east end of the nave will be able to see that there is an anchor on that map marking Haddington Port, as it's written, with a picture of a little ship um, beneath it, a double-masted a double ship be beneath it. Um, I, I confess, I first went to Abilady and I, I thought, I can't see a deep water port here. I, I really can't. Um, but um, uh, I'm really indebted to the Abilady Conservation Society's website because uh, once one starts examining that and looking at the conservation work which local volunteers, no, I'm sorry, the survey work which local volunteers have undertaken at Abilady, one begins to get a much better idea of the potential of that area. That's been supported by archaeological work by CFA Archaeology, um, which have um, uncovered timbers surviving. Um, a, a large block of timber with a mortise in it, and then you can see there's a, a, an upright timber which was tenoned in, in, into that. And there's been work done on the potential tidal range at Abilene as well. And that tidal range 
it can be as much as five meters. Well, one only needs two to three meters to float a cog. So um, these deep water carriers could have been coming in to Abilady in my view, and therefore give some sustenance to the idea that it might well have been a relatively substantial port for the likes of Haddington. You'd be able to stay there longer if you go to Leith, but at least you could have come in. What, where are those ports on the other side? Well, I've already mentioned the fact that Middleburg on Zeeland, um, in what is now the Netherlands, but was in the county of Flanders, became the staple port. The great Stadhuis that you can see in the bottom left there, uh, second half of the uh, 15th century, it's the beginning of the 16th century, is almost certainly where Andrew Halliburton was based when he was um, uh, the um, conservator of the, of the Scottish staple. And you can see that on the, uh, uh, on the map, the, the uh, harbour there with a whole range of ships coming in, a protected harbour indeed with, um, with fortified gates across it. Uh, the other place was Veer, fairly near to, to Middleburg, where uh, is a surviving 16th century Scottish house um, also used for the staple, and if you look very closely in the centre of the facade, you'll be able to make out a sheep, as one can see there. Um, that's what the staple was for. It would help market the wool of Scotland, and here is that Scottish house. More than that, they were probably washing the wool as well to make sure that it got a good price in the market, because in 1551, the, um, uh, the merchants there were provided with a cistern, um, almost certainly to assist them to, uh, uh, to, to wash the fleeces. The cistern's so famous, it's also on the great tapestry of Scotland, now down in Galashields, which is what the image is on the right-hand side. Um, Scots were getting into Scandinavia as well, there was, significant, there was a significant Scottish population in Helsingor, or Elsinor, um, as in Hamlet, uh, in Denmark. A, um, uh, a Scot um, in, uh, uh, in Elsinor was um, called Alexander Lyle. Um, he was the son of a Scottish immigrant and was twice mayor of the town of Elsinore, as well as being controller of the Sound, the Kagagak, as um, uh, one goes between the North Sea and, um, uh, and the Baltic Sea. So, um, and that controlled all trade between um, Denmark and Sweden, as well as the trade going in and out of those two, two uh, seas. And his house still stands in, in Elsinore. And of course, there was a Schotten dyke, a Scottish dyke um, in Bruges. Uh, that's it. Um, there were several national areas within Bruges. There's an English dyke as well as a Scottish dyke there. But Bruges, as I said, silted up at the end of, uh, in the middle of the 15th century. Um, and it was never the principal port anyway, because it was the end of a river called the Zvin River. And the, Zin, the Zvin River um, uh, had a series of little outports along it, which had been investigated by the University of Ghent in recent years using a range of archaeological techniques. So field walking, uh, geophysical survey, drone aerial footage, etc. Um, they've even done molehill surveys, going around and kicking down molehills, recording what was in the molehills and then plotting it. And from that, they've been able to reconstruct an entire small port called Monacareda and see how it developed over, over a period of time. Now, um, uh, one of the other things they did, though, was also to look at stone. Flanders doesn't have any stone. It's like East Anglia. East Anglia's got, but it doesn't have any other stone, and Flanders is the same. So if one finds cobbles like this, you start to think, well, where did these come from? Um, uh, they're geologically exotic stones, and when they started to examine them, they found that the bulk of them came from this area, from, or rather, 
just outside East Lothian, um, Berwickshire and northern Northumbria around, around Berwick-on-Twee. So what is happening almost certainly is that we're getting these locally derived stones used as ballast which are being taken over to Flanders and then they're being offloaded off the ship and they're being reused these days in a modern farm but um, uh, presumably sourced from a pile of them which which been uh, dumped out, out of a ship. Um, these small little ports, such as Mo Monica Rada, um, in, um, uh, in, in Flanders, can give us some idea of the way in which similar ports might have been um, uh, established along the East Lothian coast. Tantalan we've already had in several talks this morning. This is the view from the castle, looking down at what the castle uh, display board has a reconstruction of a series of small boats coming into that port. Tantalan is a high status site, it's got high status pottery with it. So here for instance we've got uh, Dutch uh, pottery on the left, a, um, uh, a piece of Italian um, maleolica in, in it as well, and some Spanish pottery uh, 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 and some German stoneware rather uh, on, on the right hand side. Now, it's not just that sort of thing that we're coming into small ports, but fish could, could be coming in too. And um, uh, the range of fish, um, in this instance cod, it swims slowly across, um, and um, uh, may well have included cod, but it probably also, and most importantly, included herring. Now we know that there was a very large population increase in Western Europe as a whole between the 11th and the 14th centuries. Um, there's a bit of a check in the middle of the 14th century called the Black Death, but there was a, a significant increase in, in population. You can, you can see it on, on, on the chart here. Mainly an urban population, these big urban populations needed protein, they needed feeding, and there's been a great deal of research which has been undertaken um, uh, over the past or so years looking at the sources of fish and where they were coming from using a range of modern isotopic techniques. And there's an entire lecture which could be given on fish and I would love to do so, but I won't. What I will say though is that it's complicated because whilst you can dry and salt fish and you therefore need lots of salt and major areas for salt production were either in Germany um, at Lüneburg uh, whether it was being quarried at Salt Mountain or places like the east coast of Scotland where salt is being uh, essentially burnt in salt pans um, near the coast and then also exported from documents about the, the salt going out. It is complicated because when we look at certain sites, another one we've already heard about this morning at Old Hain, um, and um, uh, a significant number of burials found there, relatively early medieval. They start looking at the burials and, and um, uh, telling from the isotopes what these people have been eating and what they had not been eating was fish. And if they were eating fish, it tends to be in fresh fish, but they're right by the sea. So why aren't they eating the marine fish? And could it be that the marine fish are therefore perhaps an urban um, commodity rather than a rural one. It's the sort of thing that you sell to the towns. It's possibly an area for us to be thinking about in the future. So just to come to an end, because I realize I've got about three minutes left, um, uh, what are the potentials that we have for examining um, our future understanding of the way in which there was an interrelationship between Scotland and the rest of continental Europe. Well, one of the things we can start doing is looking at um, innovative techniques for uh, investigating sites. Now, one already uses geophysics. Here, um, in work, oddly enough, by the University of Nottingham at um, uh, Lethinge near Ostend, they were using phosphate analysis, which enabled them to look on this particular farmstead at the manner in which the stock being held and moved around the site and they could work all that out from the chemical signature. We can start using, well people already do of course, we can use electron microscopy to look at um, things like the tempering of material and glazes on pottery but more locally it could be used um, at North Berwick 
famous excavations at the beginning of the 20th century at North Berwick uncovered a whole range of tiles which were thought to have been imports. There's been some recent uh, additional work sponsored by Historic Environment Scotland down there checking on, the, on, on that uh, er, earlier excavation. And it's now thought there's a possibility that they might have been manufactured in Scotland. Well, again, it's quite possible that we may be able to look at um, uh, the microscopy of that and work, and work that out. But the mere fact that they were originally thought to be imports um, is, is also itself very interesting. Uh, we can look at isotopic analysis. This has most recently been done in Leith, not quite in East Lothian, but not very far away. Live there, so it's very important. Um, and, um, uh, but the tramway project uh, for the trams down, down, down to New Haven um, meant that a whole range of individuals were uh, excavated and a number of those were uh, analysed um, uh, in order to get some idea as to where these individuals came from. Now it's a very, very localised sample and so far the furthest individual that they seem to have been able to identify, at least according to that report that they published, came from as far away as Haddington. Um, but I suspect that um, it will be possible if uh, in a, in a, in a port, big port like Leith, if one got a larger sample of uh, skeletons, you would see individuals coming from much further afield. Um, we illogically could do more about understanding major bulk exports like coal um, and salt. Um, we're probably going to get more about this in a more modern period late, later on, but we do know that coastal salt pans were recorded from the 12th century in Scotland. We know that there was a big customs duty on salt which was introduced in 1429. We know that the um, salt production was linked to the collieries in the medieval period, so there's a great deal of potential research that could be done. I talked about luxury goods coming in. These are cloth seals from continental cloth manufacturers um, found within, um, uh, within British contexts, in, in pra practically entirely within English contexts, um, there must be luxury cloth coming into Scotland. There isn't a single continental cloth seal yet to be found and recorded in East Lothian, not one. But there must be. There are people here who would have been um, importing luxury cloth. So it's something we could be looking out for. Pilgrimage and the movement of individuals. I've got one minute. I've got three slides. 20 seconds. Pilgrimage and movement of individuals. Um, we've already, we, were, we were told this morning about the Earl's Ferry, as we were talking about, um, as we were listening to, rather, um, a, a, a talk on um, uh, 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 language. Um, the, uh, uh, at the top there, you can see the pilgrim badge mold of St. Andrew from North Berwick. So they were making pilgrim badges probably in North Berwick to sell to the people who were going across the Earls Ferry to and from the shrine at, at, St, at St. Andrews. Um, we've got pilgrim badges of St. Margaret of Scotland recently found in Cambridgeshire, for instance. So we know about people moving around. We know about traders moving around and leaving their cultural signatures. Um, the left-hand slide shows the baptism of Christ from a burnt Nocta altarpiece now in the Santa Ana Museum in Lübeck, but it was uh, paid for by the merchants to Scania. Scania is in, in southern Sweden. Similarly, we've got the famous Trinity altarpiece um, in Edinburgh, uh, uh, now in the, in the National Gallery in Edinburgh. And I've just put up the type of pottery uh, that you can see there, which is being used by John the Baptist in that image to baptise Christ. And my final slide, therefore, is just to emphasize that great range of, contract, of contacts, uh, to put in a little plug for my book, if any of you want to read further on this. Um, and it's also available electronically online. And to keep your eyes open, that little bird on a piece of pottery there is actually Beauvais Scrofito from northern France, and it found its way to Leith, not very far from here.